Minister, distinguished guests, I think the fact that we're actually gathered to worry about how to protect our reserves is a good and a happy thing because we have reserves to protect. And this is actually quite an extraordinary thing. And if you dig back into the debates over this revolutionary scheme in 1990, you will find that Dr. Tony Tan, who was then the Minister for Education, actually said that the economic success of Singapore was actually more the exception than the rule. So I think I wanted to start with, uh, with that point. We do have reserves to, uh, to protect, and how, what is the best way to protect them? I don't think anyone disagrees that it's important to protect, not squander money. Most of the contention is over how best to protect these reserves. But as far as the elected presidency scheme is concerned, it is a unique Singapore experiment. It is, in a sense, revolutionary because it does depart from the ceremonial head of state we associate with the Westminster system of parliamentary government, which we adopted and adapted from the English. But it's also evolutionary because we're quite English in our thinking. We like things uh, to progress and we like to modify and refine things according uh, to experience, which is reflective of a strain of constitutional pragmatism in Singapore. So even though in its exception, one could argue the elected presidency was revolutionary, I would say in the past 20 years of its development, its path has been evolutionary. It is also an uh, institution which has undergone a great deal of amendment and refinement if you count all the constitutional amendment bills in Singapore, there are about 40 since 1965. 11 of these are heavily concerned with the elected presidency since 1991. Some of these amendments have been relatively minor. Some have been, to my view, quite major. One of the most major ones, if you like, uh, took place in 1994, when in a sense the government rolled back on the idea that the president should have a veto over drawdowns on financial reserves, by saying, that's the general principle, but this cannot apply in relation to defense and security measures. Now, if you dig deeper into uh, the uh, Hansard, you will find that a certain Mr. Tan Cheng Bok actually said in 1994 that he believed that the presidential veto should uh, uh, be maintained over defense spending. So in a sense, uh, he, were, he kind of bucked the trend even back in 1994. Now, the notion of having a check upon the cabinet shows that in constructing constitutional institutions, we're trying to find a golden mean between efficiency and accountability. And the idea of having elected president was to make the system a little bit more inefficient to deal with those issues, uh, uh, the, the worst case scenario of irresponsible spending. And even though this institution has been in existence for some 20 years now, it continues to have its detractors. It had detractors from the start. Dr. Lee Siu Cho, for example, said, why do you need this scheme? Really, it's doing the job of what a good parliamentary opposition should. And if you look at the Workers' Party manifesto, they also consider that this institution should be abolished. So that's just to set the, the broader context. But let's go back to the beginning. And the reason why Singapore embarked upon this constitutional experimentation seems to reside in the concerns of the first Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, in 1984, where he said, look, what happens if we have freakish election results and we end up having a very irresponsible government which raids all our hardened reserves and leaves Singapore prostrate and bankrupt within one five-year spending spree? And he correctly observed that the way the constitution was set up Everything could be undone. Anything could be spent. There were no institutional barriers. Whether this kind of activity was pushed by a very strong cabinet or a relatively weak cabinet, which was in a, a coalition government. Basically, all you need is a one-seat majority, and you can apparently undo everything. So that's when the conversation started about having some kind of blocking mechanism for the past reserves. But I do want to underscore this. I mean, I'm not very good at accounts, but I know the difference between a current account and a saving account, right? The president was never meant to have any power over the current account, only the saving account. So from the outset, the scope of the mandate was somewhat limited. So even though it was mooted in 84, it really took flesh in two white papers issued in 1988 and 1990. 
And it went through various permutations and, and modifications, and a range of institutions were considered, uh, including, for example, having an upper house or increasing the powers of the Presidential Council of Minority Rights, creating a Federal Reserve Board like the U.S., or even enforcing an annual budget surplus. But what we really see is an attempt to use the Constitution to regulate economic policy. So in a sense, you are trying to tie the hand of the government of the day uh, through stipulating certain rules. For example, uh, I suppose today, when it comes to net investment returns, the government can't spend 100% of it. It must save 50% of that because the idea is you need to save up for the future. So that actually embodies a principle of intergenerational equity. So eventually, it was all modified. The idea was to have one big precedent. Uh, originally, there was a plan to have a vice president, but that was kind of ditched. And eventually, there were additional functions kind of like tagged on. But I want to focus primarily on the financial aspect. Now, because, in a sense, a president is elected and commands, if you like, the general support of all Singaporeans, some of the discussions that I've noticed has been on whether or not the president can be a competing center of political power. Now, this is the odd thing, because this is a different kind of politics. In a sense, you think of the general elections, the rough and tumble there, you know, all's fair there. But the idea is that the contest for the presidential office should be more elevated, more rarefied, more refined. And that perhaps is befitting the dignity of the office. And there might be a kind of like conflict insofar as you want the president to be a unifying symbol father of the nation kind of idea, much like President Wee Kim Wee, President Nathan was and is. But the moment you make an office elective, you make it competitive, and competition can be very bitter. So you might have to negotiate these kinds of, of strains. Uh, I would also point out, too, that uh, the target of this host institution was not to deal with unlawful executive action. You have administrative law for that, but for lawful action, which would be against uh, national interest, if you like, poor economic policy to a limited extent. Now, when you look at the institutional design of, of a constitutional creature, uh, it's important to go back to the original intent and it is clear from the earliest days that the elected presidency wasn't meant to be inaugurate an executive presidency, but to be kind of like super added on top of the existing parliamentary system. So I've dug it up because lawyers all must have citations. Uh, the 1988 white paper basically says the prime minister and cabinet keep the initiative to govern the nation. Uh, the system has worked satisfactorily. We don't want radical changes. So basically, aside from the stipulated areas over which the president has some kind of safeguard role, everything else is as per normal. Uh, to make things clear, they said clearly the president will not be executive, not like uh, the president in France or Sri Lanka, where the president actually has the power to influence or perhaps even set the legislative agenda. Uh, this understanding was also very apparent to our first elected uh, president, President Ong Teng Cheong. If you look at his swearing-in speech, he uh, says as much and uses the word custodial. Now, the cust word custodial has been a bit problematical because it doesn't actually appear anywhere in the Constitution. Right? And it's become a bit of a, a hot potato because of the misunderstanding over the role of the president. But it's interesting that even from uh, the, the start, uh, there was this idea that the president shouldn't be able to, in a sense, uh, be kind of like a roving ombudsman. He was confined to certain uh, specific matters. So if indeed the presidential system was super added to the parliamentary system, we really need to understand the parliamentary system to figure out how this was modified. And the, I suppose the governing uh, uh, provision in the Constitution is Article 21, which basically says the general rule is that the president acts on the advice of the cabinet. Right, but that is the general rule, and there are exceptions to this rule listed out in 21 Clause 2. All right, I'm not going to read them all out, but I do want to, to uh, focus a bit on the very last clause, Article 21 Clause 2 I, because this seems to be a little bit more open-ended. It says that the president may act in his discretion with respect to any other function, the performance of which the president is authorized by the Constitution to act in his discretion. Now, some people have argued that uh, if the president wants to, for example, uh, support a social cause, uh, this is uh, not written in the Constitution, and therefore he should have a free hand. And we're really asking the question, what model are we working with? Are we working with a specific authorization model, the president can only act if he's expressly authorized, or specific prohibition order uh, model, he can do anything he wants unless the Constitution says he cannot? 
Right? And let's not forget, too, that the Constitution also says the cabinet bears the general direction and control of the government. Right? So is there some confusion over this notion whether the president is an executive president? Well, clearly he's not. Right? He does not control the legislative agenda, but, and there have been many, many uh, ministerial statements of the effect that he, his powers are custodial, reactive, and blocking. But I would argue that the president does have executive powers, even though he's not an executive president. This is because the president is part of the government in Chapter 5 of the Constitution, and it's provided in Article 23 that executive authority is vested in the president and exercisable by him or the cabinet. My point is this. My view is that executive power is divisible. There is reactive uh, executive power and proactive uh, executive power. Uh, so my take as a lawyer would be the president has executive power, but is not an executive president. I suppose that custodial is a most, more preferred political descriptor, and it's more useful because it, in a sense, doesn't suggest a president with a very proactive agenda. But again, too, it's not the president against the prime minister because he has to work in tandem with the Council of Presidential Advisers, which functions basically like a de facto Senate. His, his powers are limited only to past reserves. And what most people aren't, don't seem to be aware of is this. There's, while the president may be a check on the cabinet, parliament is a check on the president. Because there is provision in the constitution that, for example, if the president says no to a supply bill, uh, if cabinet can command a two-third vote from the parliament, then they can override the president's veto. All right. So, so long as, as the cabinet can control two-third vote, the president's power uh, is not very effective in that sense. Okay, this is Article 148. This, is, this proves it. I'll let you look at it yourself. But I want to talk a bit more about how the presidency has developed and suggest that we have to look not only at the text of the constitution, but the action, what's been going on for the past 20 years. And in this context, when I'm studying the elected presidency scheme, I look at three sources of power. One is the constitutional text. The second is constitutional convention, which is custom and practice. And the third is what I might call soft constitutional law, which is different in the sense that it deals with uh, rules of engagement, which are written down in documents formally, but these documents are not actually binding. And I'll give you a very clear example of what I mean by that later. I also want you to think in terms of three ways the presidency can, has acted. Firstly, law. When parties go before a court, they bear, take the risk of, of losing. And in 1995, Pre President Ong took a very technical legal issue the, uh, uh, over Article 22H and brought it before a constitutional tribunal, and that was sorted out by the courts. What was, in a sense, a bit more controversial is politics. And the best example of that, of course, is the 1999 Ong Ting Chong uh, press conference where he basically uh, added his dirty linen in, in um, public and uh, certain, uh, I, I disquieted the government enough for them to have a very extensive uh, debate and ministerial statements in, the, in the parliament. So this is very interesting because the constitution is not just simply what the constitution says. It also depends, if you like, in practice on how the relevant constitutional actors act and react to each other. And because the government reacted negatively to the idea of a president being confrontational and abrasive rather than diplomatic, uh, we can see that this is not the kind of thing that at least that side of the government would be supportive of. Now, the direct result of that was the production of a third white paper in 1999, which is very significant. And I would be very interested to know whether the presidential candidates intend to adhere by this or not. This is not a binding paper, but it does set out institutional rules of engagement. And it actually says that we will presume this will govern our relationship until one party tells the other party, I don't want to follow this anymore. And the chief provision seems to be we must have a working harmonious relationship. Right? And in a sense, some people argue that President Nathan's uh, tenure very much reflected this, you know, velvet gloves rather than boxing gloves, and the fact that uh, the very smooth uh, transition when it came to the 11-day process before he gave his assent to allow the government to draw down on uh, past reserves uh, in 2009. Now, what is interesting about this is this. This is what we call the constitution as an institution, right? The product of the actors. And uh, this white paper itself um, developed uh, largely because of uh, what President Ong did. He was always trying to push the limits. For example, he thought the CPF board was going to draw down on its budget, and he wanted, in a sense, to uh, gazette it. He said it was a good budget. I will say yes, but I need to gazette it. The government said, hold off. Please don't do this. 
let us try and arrange it. And the government came to the conclusion on a different basis of accounting that there was no drawdown. But in the white paper, it says if the president is going to gazette that there's going to be a drawdown, he must first tell the cabinet. So the cabinet has the option to decide whether or not, to, in a sense, to adjust the accounts to ensure there is no drawdown. So I suppose uh, I, I had better shut up soon, but if I'll just steal half a minute before Mr. Devan kills me. Uh, this is very important, right, because it's something the Presidential Elections Committee is going to be looking at. And I want to point out two things, right? If you look at the criteria for the president in Article 19, it's both subjective and objective. Article 19 says that uh, the president committee must be satisfied the person is of integrity, good character, and reputation. Now, that's a very subjective criteria, and we don't know what kind of information the Presidential Elections Committee is looking at. The thing that's also interesting is that if you come up with a reason saying so-and-so is of a poor character, that's potentially defamatory. But the Presidential Elections Act says you cannot sue uh, anyone in the PEC uh, for libel unless you can prove malice, which is almost impossible. So my concern is this, you know, you, in front of the nation, you could be potentially defamed as someone of a poor character. We need to think in terms of improving the system by having something like a right to reply, or at least giving the chance to the candidate to have an interview with the PEC. It doesn't have to be open door, it can be closed door, because it's important. In Singapore, where reputation is so important, the reputation of candidates must also be protected. So my last point is this. It's to do with the clause that many of our candidates are invoking because they may not necessarily have been CJ or minister or speaker. And it's Article 19.2.4, which says that if you have a similar or comparable position of seniority or responsibility, uh, you might be able to satisfy the PEC that uh, you have financial competence and literacy. Right? The thing about it is this. What if you are the CEO of a company of 99, uh, a paid-up capital of $99 million? Is that enough? I would urge the PEC to take not a literal approach, but a purposive approach. Because what you're looking for is competence in financial literacy. You don't need to have a PhD. Because honestly, the kind of sums and maths that the president has to do is so complex. If you look at the Constitution, they have to deal with things like long-term real rates of return. I teach this in my course, and all my students start crying. And at the end, I say, no, I don't understand this, so this is not examinable. Because I don't know what a long-term real rate of investment is. But my point is this. The president can, uh, doesn't have to act by himself. He can call upon an expert. He can call upon the Council of Presidential Advisors. And even Minister Taman said in 2008, the Council of Presidential Advisors are not necessarily people of high financial expertise. They are men of substance in business who can hear a good argument and test it. So let us not forget that when you're thinking in terms of qualifying someone for this job, he doesn't stand alone. He has pools of expertise uh, to, to engage us. I'm sure you'll have many questions later, but I had better stop now. Thank you.